Most constituencies stay with the same party election after election. These are generally called safe seats. Critics have argued that quite often women and ethnic minority candidates are put forward as challengers for these seats when they are unlikely to win. There definitely has been historically a trend for the parties to put women and ethnic minorities in the unwinnable seats, absolutely. And I personally think that the only way the parties will push women and minorities further up um, to more winnable seats is when there's political pressure to do so. And I think you can see clear examples of parties using increasing numbers of women and ethnic minorities in their ranks as a sort of electoral strategy. So they often will think, well, the voters will like this at election time. I'm tired of political parties that, that purported to show that they care about diversity uh, and given a few crumbs that we've got a few candidates in completely unwinnable seats. I, I, we deserve to see real political will that shows black and minority female talent and others able to stand in winnable seats. Talking about constituencies and seats, this brings us to the subject matter of candidate selection. In pursuit of an insight into the highs and lows involved, I delved into the world of the prospective parliamentary candidate or the PPC. Three different women from three different parts of London representing three different political parties, but all have one thing in common, political ambitions of becoming a member of parliament. At the end of 2013, Amna Ahmed was selected as the Lib Dems parliamentary candidate to contest the seat in the constituency of Streatham in South London. So, Amna, tell me, why politics? Most people will think you're crazy. Mm -hmm. It's uh, <laughs> an arena that people, a lot of people consider elitist and out of touch with the common people. Why politics? Well, for me, politics means everything. And the reason for that is that I've come from a really difficult background and fairness and a sense of right is something that's been in me from a very young age. So politics for me is a way to help other people speak up. I'm good, not too bad. Dawn Butler is the third black woman to become MP after Diane Abbott and Una King. Her seat was abolished in boundary changes in 2010 and she is currently the Labour PPC for Brent Central. In terms of candidate selection, of course all the three parties have their own processes and selection processes, but in terms of the Labour Party, do you think there could be some reform, something to improve the situation in order to get more women, and especially minority women, through to be selected? Yeah, all the political parties have to improve uh, their rate of getting diversity into Parliament. All the political parties have to do that. The Labour Party are obviously ahead of the other parties, but yeah, there's a lot more they can do, and I'm personally helping to make sure that that happens. Relatively new to politics, former professional sportswoman Molly Samuel Leeport is the Conservative PPC for the constituency of Walthamstow. She was awarded a CBE in the Queen's 2015 New Year's Honours. You're obviously quite a formidable person, having been seven times karate champion. However, standing as a PPC here, do you feel intimidated? Because you might, you might not have as much political background or knowledge as some of the other candidates. I don't think people select you on that. They select you on what you're prepared to do for your community, them, on an individual level. I do not feel intimidated. You don't become a seven-time world champion if you think of number two all the time. So in terms of being put forward as a candidate, you representing yeah. the Lib Dems. Are there any challenges in this process? There are, there are so many challenges. Firstly, it's an issue of trust. Uh, people don't trust politicians these days and that's very difficult just as a base challenge in terms of speaking to voters and getting them to see that there are people out there who, are, who want to help and who are able to do so in a way that makes sense for them. With me, I'm a single parent mother. I was a teenage mother, I struggled. Um, I've come, I'm probably completely the opposite to what people think. I think the difference is, is that people from my background now, their aspirations are higher. It's a lot of money and you've, you know, you will find that after 2010, Parliament's full of wealthy millionaires. This country is run by millionaires because they make it difficult for ordinary people to get into politics. It's not only for people who have personal wealth. It is a difficult thing to do. I mean, I'm working full time as well as doing this, and that's a real challenge. I'm, you know, it, it means that you make a lot of sacrifices. So you've previously tried to enter politics, wasn't successful. You're now standing as a PPC. What's keeping you going? 
because I believe that, you know, I can do it. I can achieve being an MP. You have to go through these phrases, these, these different procedures, you know, processes, you know, to gain the experience and also to get selected. We're here in the Streatham constituency where the resident MP, Chukka Amunu, is very popular. And um, looking at the figures, the likelihood of him retaining his seat is high. Do you think it was tokenistic of the Lib Dems to put you forward as an Asian woman, given that the Lib Dems have zero minority representation and very low female representation? No, I don't think so. I don't think it's tokenistic to put me forward. And if I had felt that at any stage, I would have dropped out of the process because that is not my interest. I don't want to be a token for something that somebody else believes in. I'm standing here because I believe in this area. Tell me about some of the positives in this whole experience. I've been able to help people that had never been helped before. I've been able to connect with people that never felt they were connected to the political system. I've been able to show people that politics just isn't about um, male, pale and stale. And I've been able to do that just by doing that, just by being there, just by having a voice for people. And that's been a good thing and that's been the thing that's kept me going. Come the 7th of May, the public will determine the fate of these three prospective parliamentary candidates. Once counting of the votes is complete, the three will know if all their hard work has paid off and if they can take an oath of allegiance to the Crown in order to take a seat in Parliament. In the last poll in 2010, more than 9.1 million women failed to vote compared with almost 8 million men. Political engagement, of course, needs some element of political awareness. Do the general public feel sufficiently informed about what our politicians and our political system have on offer? Let's find out. Do you feel sufficiently informed, knowledgeable about politics? Um, fairly, yeah. Uh, yes, to a certain degree. A lot of people don't vote because they don't understand. I don't really understand that much. It's all a lot of facts and figures. I certainly had to kind of work out from scratch what left wing and right wing actually meant. It's not often presented in a way that's very understandable. I think I'm pretty informed about politics, yes. I think unless you're interested, not much is done to encourage you to be interested. But I try to keep on top of some politics, but not everything, no. Despite the burgeoning information available in the public domain, especially across the web, about how to vote, details about MPs and parties and their manifestos, many still feel out of the loop. According to the 2014 Audit of Political Engagement from the Hansard Society, only 23% of the public agree that Parliament encourages public involvement in politics, compared with 30% in the previous two audits. There is a critical responsibility, a primary responsibility, from the state, from governance, to educate and empower ordinary citizens to, to, to know how to engage to engage effectively. But there's also a responsibility on us. Look, these institutions belong to us. They work better when we're involved. And so it's for us to know. The jargon of politics is a problem. It's like the jargon in any community. And if you go into a hospital, people seem to be speaking a different language to you. If you watch TV, there's a sort of different language as well. And it is absolutely the duty of politicians to speak in an easy way for people to understand because we get very caught up here in the Westminster bubble about how things operate. I think it's probably more about telling people that it's fine to vote even if you don't know all the information. I mean, I don't know all the information, but uh, that wouldn't stop me from voting. TV and newspapers are still the most important form of communication to supply news to the masses. However, the internet and the growth of social media are playing a key role in offering the average citizen another platform to politically engage. The virtual world has brought the voter, politician and party closer than ever before. However, there's no concrete evidence that this is increasing political engagement and electoral participation. There's an argument that the government needs to think more about its social media presence, how it sort of explains issues um, you know, outside of reports and making sure that government websites, um, you know, are as accessible and as easy to understand as possible. What I'm finding and what a lot of members of parliament are finding is the power of social media. 
I had to be rather dragged kicking and screaming to Facebook um, when I first started using it, not really understanding the reach that it has. Now I've become quite a devotee. The variety of media, particularly social media, makes it easier uh, for um, minority uh, politicians and female politicians to have their voice heard. Because if you're not getting on to the 10 o'clock news on the BBC, if you're not in the major newspapers, you can still communicate with your electorate. Only 39% of young women used their ballot paper in 2010, compared with 50% of young men in the 18 to 24 age group. Democratic Audit UK found that although young women in this age group may be no less politically engaged or politically informed than young men, they are less likely to partake in elections than their male counterparts due to gender-specific challenges limiting their political participation and democratic representation. You know, I just think in terms of engaging the population, getting rid of the apathy that exists uh, across, I mean, the turnout at the last election was about 65%, but you know, why shouldn't it be 85%? You know, it really, if we want to get rid of some of that apathy, we need to get to the, to the young people and try and get them seeing just exactly what it is we're, we're trying to do. Young adults aged 16 to 24 account for 12% of our population. That's around 7.4 million youth. One in four children under the age of 10 in the UK is already from a minority group and this number will continue to grow in the coming decades. Political awareness and political engagement of these young is vital for the future success of UK's political system. British Youth Council is one of several organisations encouraging young people to take an interest in and attain an understanding of our political process. Tell me about your organisation and what is it you do? The British Youth Council is a membership organisation. We have over 260 members who uh, get their young people to feed into what our policies should be. As an organisation, we then ask, get the government to implement those policies. Um, our whole trustee board is under 25 and we enable young vo people's voices to be heard and acted upon. Today this event is about launching our youth manifesto, uh, which is basically five issues that young people are saying that they want from the general election. Lisa, why is it important that young people vote? Well, quite simply because if you don't vote, then politicians like me can't hear you. The only real way to make your voice heard is through the ballot box. When it comes to politics, do you think young people are disenfranchised? Definitely. There's not enough education that's happening at school. There's a gap in the PSHE curriculum. There's not something that's offered universally and there's just not this public awareness. No, I don't think so. I think that they do engage with the political system sort of when they're asked, but perhaps they need to be asked a bit more often. Research has found that young girls, young women aged between 18 and 24, although maybe uh, be as politically aware as their young male counterparts, are less likely to vote. What do you think can be done in order to get these young women more politically active? I think what's really interesting about young women having these issues that they know they're passionate about but not potentially aligning that with their vote is that the current Westminster system doesn't account for them. They don't talk about them enough. They don't go out to, and speak their language. I think it's an issue and we need to ensure that we, we give our messages, I think, in much simpler ways, but not just for young people, for the population as a whole. Last year, following Scotland's decision to allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote in the independence referendum, MPs debated the case for lowering the UK's voting age to 16. Less than 50% of uh, 18 to 24 year olds voted at the last general election. Do you really think there's an argument to lower the voting age to 16? As a 16 year old, I massively feel there's an argument to lower the voting age to 16. One, even if people who are 18 to 24 year old aren't voting, that's not a case to say we shouldn't widen the franchise. If people have the democratic right to vote, they also have the democratic right to choose not to vote. And that's not an argument for not giving the voting age to 16. Because there is a lack of political education, the 18-year-olds aren't voting. But what I say is that if we had political education and 16-year-olds already would that have that knowledge, if they if it's on if like election day is on a school day, for example, they'd go into school, they'd be able to cast a vote. There's that whole general atmosphere of your voice counts, teachers encouraging you, talking it amongst the pupils, and actually being in school when the general election happens could actually increase voter turnout. So, in terms of getting your message out there to the youth of uh, the UK, how successful do you think you've been? What what 
what successes have you had? Mm -hmm. The uh, League of Young Voters has been incredibly successful in terms of getting their message out. We found that initially when you ask young people, do you care about politics? They'll say, no, it doesn't really affect me. But then once we break it down, we debate the issues. We say, what is it that affects you? Um, they have strong opinions. And then when we've shown them the policies that have been implemented into government um, and shown them that, that if you don't vote, government isn't going to listen to you, they actually are like, okay, give me that registration form. We're going to go out, register to vote. As previously mentioned, there are a number of organisations contributing to the political awareness and political engagement of our youth. But what are politicians doing in this regard? I set up a charity called Uprising because all my life I was aware of the fact that there was so much talent and it often gets missed. And I wanted to find a way of giving back to, initially it was to my local community, uh, and that was by making sure all the networks that there were out there through my profession uh, and so on, all the people I'd come across could help mentor young people, young talented people, uh, in order to support them to get into positions of power so that they can use that power to help others and to help their community. I hope in years to come, uh, and I hope we don't have to wait very long, we will have MPs who have been trained and supported through this leadership development program and it's supported by the three party leaders. A majoritarian political system of first past the post, where the candidate with the most votes in the constituency wins, is considered by many to be highly disproportional. Critics argue that electoral systems matter and that proportional representation would work better for women than first past the post and alternative vote. It's often said that first past the post systems of election discriminate uh, or make it harder for women and ethnic minorities to become members of parliament, predominantly because each constituency returns one member. And in that kind of condition, the tendency is to prefer a candidate who looks like all the other candidates so that you don't put yourself at a disadvantage. Elector electoral systems that are proportional, particularly where you have multi-member constituencies, create an incentive to have what's called a balanced ticket. So if all your candidates in one particular area, all eight of them were men, you'd realise straight away and you'd think there was something going on. You know, I don't think changing the electoral system is the answer. I think changing the way politics is done is the answer. That's why our campaign is a people-powered campaign, going out into communities, talking directly to people about their lives, their issues, the things they want to change. You know, that's what I think will make a difference to people. Diana Johnson. Men make up 78% of MPs, so what is their role to play in readdressing the gender imbalance in the Commons? The problem is, I think, that um, a lot of the guys don't even, it doesn't enter their, um, uh, their psyche. They don't think, we're, we're a whole group of guys here, oh, there's no women. You know, they don't even think about it, it's just a normal thing. Well, feminist men have always been very important to the core, to women's um, interests and promoting them. Um, and of course, men are 78% of MPs, so without them there's not going to be change. One thing they can do is act as critical actors, so they can try and encourage women they know potentially to run. Um, they can support uh, the sort of pl proliferation of women MPs when they're able to within their parties, for example. So there is a kind of advocacy and support role that men can play. There are many issues to consider in readdressing the balance in our political system. It's evident that efforts made by the main political parties to deal with the democratic deficits have yielded some gains, but progress is woefully slow. All the political parties have their own approach to the problem, and despite there being several ideas on the table for discussion, there's no unified agreement on the way forward. Increasing the number of women in the pipeline, talent spotting, mentoring, all of those things are really important. There's certainly a role for ethnic minority MPs to be role models, but it's not just them. It's for each and every one of us who represents an un, a protected characteristic, whether it's women, ethnic minority, disabled as I am, to make sure that we're visible. So the first way to change uh, the cultural mindset of Westminster is just to acknowledge that there is a cultural mindset that exists. And I think it's harder to do that 
uh, than we think. So getting people to agree that there's a problem would be a really good first step. You know, I, I'm a great believer that the earlier you spot someone and support them through and help them make connections, get to know how political parties and the process works, the more likely they are to succeed when they decide to stand for uh, parliament or stand to become a councillor and so on. We do always point to the international evidence which suggests strongly that positive action does work. Now these are temporary measures, stop gaps if you like. You don't have to have them in place forever. You just have to have them in place for as long as it takes to get that sustainable number of, of, a, you know, of a diverse pool of candidates in equal numbers of women and men. It's a fact that women are massively underrepresented in our democratic system. But what does the future look like for women in British politics and those wanting to enter into this arena? I refuse to be pessimistic about the outlook for women and ethnic minorities in politics in the future. I think the future for women in, in British politics is fantastically brilliant if we engage, if we register to vote, if we become more assertive, if we make our demands. Look, the brilliance of our women, minority uh, women, must come to the fore and they, they will come to the fore if us as a community raise them and ensure that they can play their role in transforming our society. I believe that there is a really exciting positive future for women. Uh, there is a really exciting positive future for ethnic minorities in politics. But we have to seize the moment. We have to seize the opportunities. So I'm imagining waking up on election day. There probably will be more women MPs in the House of Commons. Most of them will be on the Labour benches. Probably 40% of their parliamentary representation will be female. The Conservative Party should increase by a few. The Liberal Democrats may suffer serious losses. The future beyond that, I think, is dependent upon whether women across the parties join together and demand quotas. Because without quotas, I think any subsequent changes will merely be incremental. The general election campaigning has started in earnest and the battle for May the 7th is on. No doubt it will be an extremely close and unpredictable race with many potential outcomes. Our political system is far from proportionally representing the population it serves and it's evident that our politicians and government, current and future, need to make considerably more real and tangible efforts in readdressing the deficit of women, especially minority women, within our corridors of power. Will the political parties put into practice their rhetoric around gender equality leading up to and after the 2015 general election? Well, time will only tell. But for now, it would seem that despite any incremental changes, politics is still a man's world. <laughs>